Hi everyone, welcome to Joshivas and How to Data. Today I'll be speaking with Georgia, who has a vast experience in data science and especially in the genomic space. And so we'll be talking about becoming a genomics data scientist. I know many of you are very curious to know what is happening in the biological sciences space with regards to data analytics. And so today we're going to be breaking the ice and diving deep down into how to become a genomics data scientist, especially drawing from Georgia's experience. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to bring Georgia on board to introduce herself. Hi, Georgia. Hi. Yeah, nice to be here. Thanks for having me. So yeah, my name's Georgia Whitten, and I've spent the past three and a bit years working in the space of data science in the world of biology. Wow. Amazing. That's 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 that sounds like you've had your hands full in the past three years with data science. Yeah, that's for sure. Lots of busy things, lots of different data types, tools, technologies. It's been a really great learning journey. Wow. And and so how would you say you got here? What was your your journey like? What's the backstory to how you became a data scientist? Yeah. Um, so I originally studied genetics and molecular biology at university. So that was my kind of field of study, just more on the biological sciences side. And then in 2019, after my second year, I applied for this internship in bioinformatics. And they told me that I didn't get it because I didn't know how to code. So I suddenly realized that learning to code was this important thing that biologists might need in the future. So I took myself away, was stuck on Code Academy, basically all during the pandemic, <laughs> teaching wow. myself Python. And then after I finished my degree in genetics and molecular biology, I'd got enough coding skills that I kind of self-taught myself that I could then go into the world of uh, bioinformatics, which was, yeah, really great. Cause I never really realized that a biological skill set was able to be combined with coding skills and that's a whole field in itself so it was really great to combine both of these interests of mine to actually have a career in this really cool space wow so you did have interest in bioinformatics from the onset while studying your your, your genetics of course um i don't know if i'd say there was an interest originally it was more right. i i suddenly found out that biologists need computational skills post undergrad yeah. um, and then it was as soon as I started learning then I got hooked but I don't think I kind of yeah I was like, oh this is so addictive um, <laughs> but I don't think while studying I kind of had any idea that I'd be into it until I tried it so I think it's really great to you know share things like this because it is a really cool interesting skill to learn Wow. Uh, and it sounds as though you 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 had faced a lot of challenges because I can admit to you that learning or self-teaching yourself about stuff can be very difficult. So would you mind sharing some of the challenges you faced? Like what, what were your most um, difficult times in your learning trajectory? Um, in terms of learning, I think whenever you learn a new skill, it's always that beginning hump that's the worst. So you yeah. start to do something new and you have no idea. You understand that there's so much to learn and you don't know any of it. And I found like that hump was like so frustrating because when I was first starting out coding, it was almost like your brain knew what you wanted to do, but you didn't you didn't know like what words would make the computer do that thing. And yeah. it was so incredibly frustrating, like knowing <laughs> what you wanted it to do, but like having no idea of the ingredients that are needed to build that thing. So yeah. I found that I found that bit really, really frustrating. But then as soon as you just like keep powering through, you do get to the point where you know how to Google the correct things and you know how to search on Stack Overflow to get the correct code to fix your problem. Because yeah. um, all the like all the answers are out there. It's just learning how to go and source them correctly. True. So that was definitely a really difficult thing to get over. And then one thing I, I've spoken to a few people about, and I think traditional computer scientists have disagreed with me, but coming from a biology background, one of the things I found really hard was 
learning to think like a computer. So normally humans presume that when they have a conversation with someone, the other person is intuitive. They can pick up on the things that you don't exactly specify. Whereas when you start coding, you know, you have to give the computer logic. You have to be very direct with your instructions. It can't presume, you know, the else of your if else statement. You have to (laughs) say specifically like, what happens if you don't do this thing? Um, so kind of changing that mindset of learning how to kind of program logically, I found like really quite difficult, but I think traditional computer scientists have been thinking like that for a long time. Yeah. So it depends on your background, but coming from biology, that was definitely hard. Wow. I think, so I guess switching the context can be very difficult if you're oriented in one particular subject like biology and now you have to think like a computer knowing that the computer is basically a dummy it does exactly what you tell it to do and it's not intuitive by itself i think that's a, a very big leap and you've managed to transition smoothly i believe yeah <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, i'm very sure you're feeling more confident and more um, um relaxed in your role as a data scientist but I know the learning doesn't end. You you keep learning. You know, someone said something very interesting that the difference between a senior software engineer and a junior software engineer is that the junior software engineer doesn't know what is obtainable in that space, doesn't know where those things are obtainable. Um, but the senior software engineer just knows a better way of obtaining some of these things. And that is information, knowing where to dig, to dig knowing where to search, knowing where to get help to unblock your your bugs to unblock whatever is getting you stuck in your code base and all that uh, so basically what they're trying to say is that both the junior and the senior software engineers are on a learning curve and nobody knows it all some people just have better experience of finding the relevant information and yeah it is no surprise that that was one of the major frustrations you faced um getting information and getting started and picking up the momentum but bringing it home what do you do basically as a genomics data scientist what what does it look like what does it feel like is it something as conventional as any data science field or are there niche things you need to know to become a successful genomics data scientist um I mean, so I I think this question kind of goes in two parts for me. So I've had two roles since finishing uh, my undergrad. So my first role was at Sanger, working as a, the title was like genomics data scientist. And then recently I've moved to the Crick where I'm now termed a kind of bioinformatician. Um, But both of these roles kind of play on genomics, but I think every different institute that will look different So I guess I can just share how that looked for me in these two different spaces. That would be fantastic. Yeah. So in my first in my first role, um, uh, it was very much we were applying data science and data analytics techniques to genomic data. Um, So whether that was kind of whole genome data or amplicon sequencing data, um, we're basically using the analytical tools that we are able to play with in Python um, yeah, and using those to make sense of this genomic data. Um, So a lot of the time you're either like extracting information from that original data source in a way that like is analysis ready and then you can go on to do all of your wrangling and pre-processing in Python Um, or other times you're actually building the computational infrastructure that is running that code. So kind of stepping away from the analytical side and more onto a slightly software development side but I wouldn't say by any means I'm the software developer (laughs) Um, (laughs) but just able to like uh, like build the pipelines that are you know calling those softwares and calling those tools to kind of bring that all together into one workflow Um, but I think one thing that's really key to point out is the fact that even as a data scientist I think when you're working in the space of genomic data science or bioinformatics you're very much connected to the biology. So you don't have to be a biological expert by no means. Uh, I mean, I'd never really worked on parasite before. And then in my previous job at Sanger, I was working in malaria parasite biology. 
Um, but you kind of pick things up as you go. Um, yeah. But I think in order to understand and interpret your data, you have to have some biological insight into what that means. So it's really, it's really nice because you get to use all of these amazing tools and technologies and problem solve these coding problems, but then you get to bring it back to biological reasoning and getting biological insight out of your data. Um, so that's that was like really, really good. Um, also in my previous job, we were quite well connected with multiple other teams in the data space. So we had um, we had like product teams, there was software development teams, um, there were more traditional bioinformatics teams who were doing more of like the pipeline building. Yeah. Um, so just really getting to be connected to a lot of different people working in agile um, working in a more business kind of way. So that was really interesting part of that role, I think. Um, so very much connected to the science, um, very much um, collaborative with these different, you know, disciplinary teams. Um, but then still at the end of the day, being a data scientist and coding and problem solving. Um, so I think that would sum up what that kind of role was in my first job. And then my new job at the Crick, um, <clears throat> I think it's quite interesting because I've always, I've always thought of genomics as the be all and end all of computational biology. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think we forget that you have a molecule of DNA, right? That then somehow changes a phenotype and like, that's what we're interested in. But there are so many other data types from DNA to the phenotype. Um, and, you know, often people working in the genomics data science space um, end up going more multimodal now. So, you know, you've got information from RNA, you've got information from images, you've got information from proteomics. Um, yep. So I think, yes, genomic data scientist is a, a very great title. Um, however, yeah, nowadays we are touching more data types than that. Um, which is really yeah great to do in my current role at the moment. Um, also, I think another thing to touch on is the fact that you get to you just collaborate with a lot of different disciplinaries. So in my current role, um, you know the team's very mixed. We've got bioinformaticians, we've got clinical fellows, like people working in the hospitals. Um, we've got um, got many ranges of senioritys many different skill sets so it's just a very collaborative role where you're not just stuck in a room full of coders just sweating yeah. away trying to problem solve it's very collaborative and you get to work with so many different people um so that's my long ramble about what it means to be a data scientist wow. working in biology that's very amazing i mean i love the fact that you have a kind of cross-disciplinary team you know working with different sub teams like the bioinformaticians the software engineers the product team and all that trying to piece things together in this genomics space I, and it's very interesting you know i used to think being a genomics data scientist you are able to also work as a bioinformatician what would you say the clear difference is because in my head it would sound as though the data scientist are responsible for like the downstream analysis or something and the bioinformaticians are doing the pipelines building but i would like you to sort of go into a bit more details than that if you can um, because yeah my my perspective yeah. could be very limited yeah no i think it's a it's a very confusing landscape when it comes to these job titles um so the way that i interpret it is i think Bioinformatician can be seen as an umbrella title um, that can cover anybody working with biological data computationally, um, also computational biologist. Um, I think these can be like umbrella titles that can capture all of those roles. Um, right. But then also you can then divide those into more specific roles where you can have a bioinformatician, a more specific one, which is traditionally pipeline building, validating the biological tools to process the different data types, um, but mainly just, yeah, building those pipeline infrastructures, but with a focus on what the tools are doing and whether that biology is accurate. So they have to have biological knowledge about what's happening to the different things in those data types. Um, then you kind of come in at the genomic data science space, which is more the analysis of what's output of those pipelines. Mm. Um, yeah, some more kind of 
modeling, forecasting, predicting, um, or just like standard analytics. Um, that's kind of what that role is doing. Um, but then you could just have a data scientist rather than genomics, um, mm -hmm. which can then be working, um, you know, on many different data types uh, that we have. Um, so I think that's how I'd categorize them. Bioinformatician can either be umbrella or it can be a more specific subset that's more traditionally pipelines. Oh, that, that that's amazing and so you say something around doing the forecasting the prediction the modeling and all that what would you say is the outcome or the output from being a data scientist in that workflow what what are you expected to get at the end of the day what does the forecast say what does the mm -hmm. uh, model predict what does it give what kind of information what benefit does it add at the end of the day because for people who do not understand all of this they are more keen to see okay so what does this change about how we do things what does it add to our livelihood yeah got you um so obviously it depends in what field you're working in what the output's going to be um, but at the end of the day, a lot of the work we do initially is retrospective. So you get samples in and you can see what's happened to them in the past. You know, what variant did somebody have that led them to get a disease? Um, what variant did a parasite or virus carry to make it, um, you know, uh, more dangerous? So it depends what the question you're looking at answering is. But essentially, it's using the information that we have retrospectively to create predictions about what something might look like forecasting into the future. So if you think about the pandemic that we've just had recently, for example, yeah. um, we've had a ton of data that we've been able to collect where we've seen, you know, the spread of different variants and how that happened across, you know, England and other places in the world who did similar tasks. Um, and if we can start to kind of look at those patterns and see the beginning of those patterns, you can get the signs of when a new pandemic might be coming. So it's understanding, can we predict, you know, the next case of variant spreading by using the information we can collect before, you know, to forecast when that might happen in the future. Um, or you can think about it. So in terms of cancer biology, what I work in at the moment, um, you know, you want to predict um, how, um, you know, malignant a tumour might be. So if you can collect data from previous cancer tumours, whether that's the DNA, the RNA, um, images of the tissue, um, you know, if you can tie this to information about the prognosis of that patient, then can you then in the future predict how a patient might do based on the DNA or the RNA or images of the tissue. So it's using all the information you have now to then try and answer questions quicker in the future in order to yeah, use biological knowledge to help change the health of people, which I think is a, a fascinating space to be in. Um, yeah. We're in such a revolution right now where we've got incredible computational power. We've got a lot of people working in the space of combining biological data with computational power and it's just really exciting where the field is going to be honest yeah and it sounds like you're doing some very impactful work because cancer is one thing that is ravaging the health of people globally and being able to contribute to that space and improve global health care i think that is an overwhelming experience but let me not say it for you what does it feel like being able to do this kind of work that you're doing and knowing where your contribution goes to to solve yeah i mean it, it feels really humbling i think it feels like such a privilege to be in a in the space where i've you know gain the right skills at the right time to be working in a field where you really can use these skills to yeah improve the way that healthcare might work in the future um it's yeah it's, it's a massive privilege and i think one thing that's really key in the world of you know computational biology is making sure that you still stay attached to the, the reason why we do what we do you know yeah. we're not just we're not just writing code you know, to put out onto the internet for people to just see, you know, we're, we're using samples that have come from real people, you know, that sample ID that's just a bunch of letters and numbers, that's come from a real person who's given you their data. 
for, for you to make insights to help other people. Um, so I think it's really key to stay attached to that concept of it's not just a data file, you know, it's, it's, it's somebody's data that they've given you. And it's such an honor to be able to use that in order to try and yeah, help other people. It's really, really nice space to work in. That, that was a beautiful way of putting it because sometimes we get detached from the actual reason why we're doing stuff and yeah. everything just becomes a data point or a number in the statistics but trying to come back to that zone where you understand that each data point represents a person who has willingly submitted their samples for you to learn from mm -hmm. and use that information to help even more people i think that is a way of gaining more um, focus, more more motivation and, and more um, admiration even for the work you're doing because you realize that this is very valuable. It's coming from a valuable place and it's going to even more valuable place. Mm. And that's a beautiful thing to do. Um, and you also mentioned you, you gained the right skills at the right time to be able to work in this space. So I'm, I know a number of people will be wondering what those skills are. I think you also mentioned in your opening that you learned during the pandemic. Mm. Uh, you gained a number of skills to be able to go seamlessly into this space. So would you like expounding on what kind of skills you learned and what amount of those skills do you use today? And if you could extend that to the tools and technologies as well, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, so in terms of like getting the right skills at the right time, um, <clears throat> when a lot of people started asking me how I learned to code, I always felt like it seemed easy because I said, oh, you know, I took X, Y, and Z courses and then suddenly I was ready. But actually my timing was just really lucky. I started learning in 2019, um, <coughs> pardon me. Um, then we had the pandemic, so it meant that we were locked in and I was just on Code Academy rather than baking banana bread or sunbathing outside. So Come on. <laughs> <laughs> my, my timing was just so lucky um, that I just started then. So I knew that I could use all my free time during lockdown to be learning coding. Whereas I'm aware now that people have full time jobs and, you know, family commitments and a social life like people don't have all the time we had during the pandemic um, yeah. you need to invest in these skills. So I think that's what I mean by yeah getting in at the right time yeah. um but also so yeah thinking about what i learned so coming from no coding knowledge at all um the first thing i started doing was just some introductory courses so i did intro to python intro to r and intro to bash so r and python are like data scientist 101 languages most companies want you to have either one or the other um, it's very rare you'd need both, but if you know one or the other proficiently, then you're going to be all right to get a job in the space. Um, and then Bash is just a fundamental language in order to access and operate your computer and any kind of high performance computing clusters you might need to be using for your big data that we have in biology. So learning those three languages was key. Um, I then realized I loved Python a lot more than R, so I decided to go down the Python route. Um, but then went into more kind of graphing and data analytics in Python rather than just those key fundamental ideas of programming. Um, so that's what I did in terms of courses. And then also I think one thing that I did when I was learning my skill set, as it were, um, I just made sure that if there was any course that was just coding um, that was free, I just went on it um, <laughs> because I think at the beginning, like I said, learning, changing that way of thinking and learning how to actually code and talk to a computer, like any experience was kind of good experience. So I did like a web development course. Um, I haven't done any web development since, but I think even like understanding the, the flow yeah. of that was helpful. Um, I also did courses on using Git um, and GitHub and version control, because that's another thing that you need to know once you get into the data science space, because even though we're not building, um, you know, like big bits of software and product, um, yeah. we are still collaborating and working in a team. So, you know, using Git and GitLab has been really key um, in data science, which um, I guess at the beginning I wasn't really that aware of. Um, 
And then in terms of bioinformatics, um, I think it's quite hard because there aren't any like specific trainings. Oh, my cat's decided to join me. Sorry. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in terms of bioinformatics, there aren't really many online courses like there are for just learning coding. Um, so the only way I was really able to learn the bioinformatics tools I needed was on the job. Um, so whether that was through like my undergraduate project, my internship, and then my job at Sanger and Crick, um, it's only like being in these roles that I've been able to use those tools. Um, but I think, you know, going back to what I'd do differently and things I could improve on, um, there are many resources online for learning bioinformatics. They just aren't in the traditional, um, like online GUI learning mm -hmm. systems. They're more just on GitLab. So a lot of people, and it's really great, a lot of people working in bioinformatics, um, A, share things on YouTube. There's so many amazing people teaching you all sorts, like how to code different things. Um, so yeah, finding amazing YouTubers. And then also there's, um, yeah, just people put Git, just like websites um, on GitHub and stuff. And they have loads of bioinformatics tutorials, um, for example, like I've just started working in image analysis at the moment and I was blown away by how many people in the community have just put up free resources, how to learn these tools um, just on websites for free. Um, wow. So I think in terms of the bioinformatics tools, there's no courses really that I've come across. It's more people in the field have made websites via GitHub that have tutorials and notebooks on how to do things. Um, so yeah, many resources out there that if I'd go back, I'd definitely make use of as I was going through. Um, so in terms of those tools I'm using now and in my previous roles, um, Python's been my main language in terms of programming languages. Um, so I use that in my previous job, in my current job, um, and I use that for basically any data task I have to do. Right. So, any wrangling I need, it's all done in pandas. Any graphing, it's all done in pandas. Um, even pipeline building pandas, <laughs> sorry. Wow. <laughs> um, um, Python, sorry, Python. I just, I love pandas, it's my favorite. Um, so yeah, any, any graphing, data wrangling, pipeline building, I'm personally doing that all in Python, um, which is, yeah, the language that I've chosen to use. And then in terms of those bioinformatics tools, um, you have like your basic bread and butter bioinformatics tools that everyone has to use. So your SAM tools, um, your GATK, um, Python also has a bunch of libraries that are great for processing biological data. And um, right. so all of those like PySAM, PyVCF, PyClone, um, there's loads of ones for genomic data. So yeah, they're the bread and butter ones. Uh, and then in terms of general Python libraries, um, NumPy has become my best friend since moving yeah. into analysis. Um, <laughs> NumPy because... is everybody's best friend. <laughs> NumPy and pandas, they've been saving lives since then. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so yeah, it's like, as long as you've learned those core analysis libraries, it's just amazing how you can take those anywhere with you. So in my current role, you know, I've jumped into cancer biology, working in image analysis, and I've never done that before. But because I'm familiar with pandas and NumPy and like Scikit, I know how I know how to work with this data, even though I've never worked with the data before, because the libraries have just like different, you know, tools in them to do these operations. So once you've got those key fundamental libraries, you can really take them into any field, any discipline. And I think that's such a beauty of this space is how transferable those coding skills are to any data type or domain. Mm, wow, that's amazing. I mean, from all you've said, I could just say that those skills you've learned can apply to, if you can apply to one data type, it can apply to any data type because at the end of the day, it's data is data, isn't it? It's just about the structure and the approach of applying those skills and mm -hmm. toolkits. And um, yeah, you did mention lots of resources and I thank you for that. But do you think it can get to a point where it is counterproductive to have this much information online on GitLab, on, on YouTube, on Stack Overflow, and people can just find it to be a plethora of solutions that even 
makes it become a problem choosing which of those courses which of those free tools to use uh which of those websites or platforms to learn from uh, it can be overwhelming but do you think that is counterproductive and how did you manage to know when you see a course and say nah that's not for me or this is for me even though they bear similar um, kind of characteristics in what they are offering how, how do you pick and choose which to go um, for yeah that's a really interesting question i think I think it really is overwhelming and I think the one thing that the community lacks at the moment is people aggregating those resources. Um, You know, it's brilliant that there's so many of these resources out there to get people to the field, but you're right, like it's so overwhelming. There's a lot of repetition um, and knowing where to go is very hard. Um, I think that's a lot of the problem with starting in this field is where on earth do you start? I think the the way that I found my courses was to be quite honest, um, someone working in data science who I was friends with at the time said that they learned on Code Academy. So that's the one I went with. Um, Mm. It wasn't like I surveyed the scene or anything. Someone in the field told me that's the one they they used and that other people in their team had used. Mm. I just used the same. Um, but I am aware that there's so many other ones like Udaca- what is it? Udemy, Datacam, DataQuest. Um, there's so many of these platforms out there, but I think um, it is hard to know which one. And to be honest, I tried one. I really liked it. So I didn't mess around and try any others. Um, and I'm glad I didn't because it would have been, you know, yeah. really, really overwhelming. So I think, I mean, personally, I think the way to find out which one works for you is probably just to ask someone who's in a job that you want, um, see what they used and then have a go at that. And then if you like the way that it's set up um, and the way that that, you know, company have designed their GUI, um, Mm. then stick with it. Um, But I think surveying them yourself, I don't think anyone's got the time to survey all these different ones and see what works for them. And at the end of the day, they are offering quite similar things. so I think, yeah, maybe just seeing what people are doing in that role, um, see what they use, and that's kind of the easiest way. Um, and then, oh, what was your last question? <laughs> yeah, like how did you, but I think you've answered the main thing because it was about having this much information to learn mm-hmm. from. And I think this leads us nicely into helping people who are looking to get started to, to actually break the ice and get into um, data science space. Uh, but you've managed to talk about one aspect which is to get somebody who is already in the field give them some recommendation on what kind of resources would be useful to them Mm -hmm. Uh, before i ask you to even expound further on what other things people should do to get started i just want to add a bit Uh, in my experience as well i think uh, i may be very conventional or conservative I, i love reading books and I think perspectives can be limiting when it comes to um, videos. There's only so much you can remember on the spot or there's only so much you can cover on a YouTube tutorial or on a course, right? But some of these books give you the the bones of what you need to know in that particular field. So that I, I had to, when I was getting started, I had to read a lot of books around data analytics. Aside from doing a course on data analytics, I had to read some books that sort of delved into every aspect of data science when it comes to statistics, the analysis, everything, visualization, tips and tricks and all that. And I find it very important. In in my previous life, I actually did mobile app development and how I got into using Flutter very proficiently at that time was I read a whole book on Flutter and because whenever I go to a tutorial on YouTube or somewhere they are usually teaching you in a context so they give you as much skills as much hacks as much tips as required by that context so that context is usually a project an example or something an exercise and it is quite limiting you know Mm. but having a book that would go extensively to teach you about concepts that will be very useful gives you a more holistic view uh yeah so i'll just end it there but continuing continuing into the conversation about 
what people should do when they have this much information. What else do you think a novice, an enthusiast, someone that wants to get started in this space needs to be aware of, aside from the fact that there are lots of information to get from and get recommendations from people who are actually doing the work? What else should they do in terms of actually breaking into that space? Yeah. Um, so in terms of breaking into the space, there's something that they definitely should do and it's something that I didn't do. Um, and it's definitely held me back in getting jobs. So um, <laughs> the the main thing you need to do if you want to break into data science, obviously you have to learn the skill set. You have to be able to sell yourself and be a good communicator because half of data science is telling people your findings. So you have to be a good communicator at sharing those. Um, but in order to get your foot in the door, um, you do need to have a coding portfolio. And that's something that I never did. Um, I was really lucky that I kind of broke into the field quite early on in my career. Um, you know, fresh out of this internship, I was coming in at a very entry level. so. I was never in a position where I needed to showcase my skills in a portfolio. Um, but then when I was looking for my second job at a higher level, um, a lot of people presumed I had a portfolio and oh. I'd, I'd never built myself a portfolio. Um, all of my code was, you know, contributing to projects internally. I didn't have a private portfolio to share my skill set with, you know, potential employers. So I think that's a really, really important thing that people should be doing if they're wanting to break in, um, is developing yourself a portfolio on GitHub. Um, and at the end of the day, it doesn't need to be anything, you know, very, very extensive. Nobody's going to go through and read, you know, lots of documentation and comments about everything you've done in these little mini projects, but yeah. just showcasing generally what are the key things that you're able to do? Um, you know, can you do computer vision? Can you do, um, you know, predictive modeling? Can you do machine learning? Um, just having like little examples of things that you can do in a portfolio, just to show people that you can code um, is a really, really important thing, I think, to breaking into the field because there are a lot of jobs in data science, but they're also very competitive. There's a lot of people wanting to move into this space now, especially yeah. with, um, you know, the way that we can have such hybrid remote working in data science, um, it's a really desirable space to be in. So I think building yourself that portfolio is a really, really key thing if you want to break in. Wow, that's 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 something I did not also do when I was getting started. I mean, yeah. I, I think that's a very key thing and people oftentimes neglect it. It's like your your proof of of life in that space to be honest yeah. people would want to see even though they are not going to look in details but it gives them a quick overview it goes beyond just having those on your resume or something yeah. but these are actual proof to show that yes you've got some experience however little or however much they are it just validates what you have said you can do on your resume and that's fantastic that you mentioned it um now talking about your first job in data science first internship what should they do to get into that because some people might have built portfolios done lots and lots of small projects and now they're looking for their first opportunity without any experience um, so you know how it is there's a kind of a deadlock people want to hire people with experience but people are not willing to be the first to give them whatever experience they need so yeah. how would you say um, someone looking to break into this space that's got their portfolio they've got their cvs they've gained the skills how yeah. would you advise them to go about navigating this challenge um i mean to be honest with you it sucks but sometimes it is about who you know um it's really important to build a network and you can start building a network even if you're not in that field officially already um i think in terms of maybe getting something like an internship um i mean the, I, the way i got mine was i had a relationship with the the supervisor anyway um i was able to suggest hey there's this grant money um you know let's apply for this grant money so i can do this internship with you um, so I think being proactive um, is really important, not just in terms of applying for things, but in terms of reaching out. Um, even if you apply for entry level roles, you know, you can reach out to the hiring manager saying, hi, like, you know, I'm really interested in this role, like X, Y, and Z. I really look forward to potentially meeting you at interview. 
um, just making a really proactive effort into like engaging with people um because you know people hire people um mm. and I think building those relationships is really key because it is difficult to take a chance on a on a cv that has no experience um whereas taking a chance on someone that you've met and had a discussion with and someone's vouch for you um is a very very different story so i think making those connections um is really really important wow key key takeaway there people hire people so if you want to get hired even for your first job you have to be as human as possible that means being proactive reaching out to recruiters knowing that there are people at the other side of the the hiring process and all that i I think that was amazing um insight you've shared and so finally i suppose what would you say in relations to the field of genomics when it comes to future forecasting i know you you're a data scientist you're very adept in modeling and predicting and saying what might be what may not be to what percentage of um, accuracy those things could be in the field of genomics data science where do you see that space going into in the next 10 15 20 years it's a a big ask but yeah gut feel gut feel and i promise i I would hold it against you (laughs) (laughs) i mean to be honest i can't as an image analyst now in my current role i honestly think the future is in extracting and you know interpreting genetic information from cheap data sources like images so we know that you know the cost of sequencing is decreasing so so rapidly um you know computational power is increasing so so rapidly So it is amazing what we can get, you know, for our money now from genomes. Mm. But the thing is, it still costs a lot of money to sequence a genome, um, where it's a lot cheaper sometimes to get certain types of images from samples. Um, So I think the future really is multimodal. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot of cases where we're, you know, we're extracting genetic information from images without even having to sequence anything from that sample um Mm. so i think that's where the future's going is it's not just genomics anymore it's transcriptomics it's image analysis it's proteomics it's getting all of these insights of these different data types derived from the cheapest one um i think that's where we're going and yeah ai is gonna be accelerating that for sure wow that that sounds very exciting and I, and I think that even reduces our time to, to market for those who are in the, the business side of things. You could easily get things out from just images without having to go through the whole sequencing and paying that huge amount of money. But yeah. that sounds very exciting. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, so to wrap it up, I would just say, what would be your recommendation for for growth, for people who are already in the field? how can they move up from maybe being a junior data scientist to a senior data scientist in the shortest possible time or switching from one company to the other like you've done very recently what Mm. kind of tips and recommendation could you give to people who are seeking career growth in data science space already okay so even Mm. beyond genomics yes so in terms of seeking progression from junior to senior i think one of the most important parts of internal progression is having someone that supports you so if you've got someone that's vouching for you whether that's your direct line manager or someone else who's in a more senior position having people in the company that really have faith in you is so important for that um particularly having a manager that wants to nurture you who wants to make sure that you are progressing as quickly as possible um is so so key to that and without that that isn't going to happen um and in terms of actually getting those next steps and going for those next roles um most companies will have um like a framework of what those different job families look like so look at that senior role look at what's different between that role description and your current one and then set some timelines with your manager you know say i want to hit x y and z in six months time 
let's review in six months. And if I've hit X, Y, and Z, let's talk about a pay rise. Like let's talk about a promotion. Um, so it's not just working away in silence, hoping that someone might notice that you're progressing. Um, it's being really proactive with voicing. I want to do this by this date. Um, and if I do, what does that mean for my career? Um, so I think that's key to advancing from junior to senior. Um, and also in terms of just what you're actually doing in that space, um, just making sure that you're listening and learning and you're not just working in a, in a siloed gap. Um, you are collaborating because if you're junior, you're surrounded by so many senior people who have yeah. so much amazing knowledge for you to learn from. So having those talks with them, even over lunch or coffee, just to learn from them um, is really key to that progression. Um, and then in terms of making a move to a different company, um, I think, I mean, I, I did find it a little bit challenging because I didn't have this portfolio. Um, and when I'd got my first role, it was selling my potential. You know, when you go for that first entry level position, yeah. you're selling your potential. You know, I could come in and like, I could grow and I could be amazing. Whereas yeah. when you're going in for, you know, a normal level job, um, you're not selling potential, you're selling your actual skill set. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I found I found that difficult because I haven't been in that situation before. Um, but in terms of those tips and tricks, I think actually just doing as many interviews as you can just to get used to that that whole process. Um, and it doesn't matter if you don't get every one. I think you learn something new from every interview you do. Um, so just making sure that you go to as many ones as you want to, um, and then just make sure that you really assess what the next role is about. Um, Cause there'll be things that are kind of written between the lines that aren't quite in the job description. And if you can vocalize that you've really understood that role and what they're really looking for rather than what's just written on the job description i think that's really key to getting those positions and also if you're moving companies every company has its own company values every company has its own things that you know they're really like focused on doing so yeah. making sure that you don't go in with your current company mindset of these are the things they care about making sure you look up that new company what are their values what are the things that they really focus on what do they invest extra time in in terms of you know outside external science development um so just yeah making sure that you're not in your old company mindset you're in the mindset of this new company i think is key to wanting to make that switch wow that's really really helpful and i am very sure that as many people that are listening are also finding this very helpful in terms of moving upwards or <clears throat> moving sideways you know to a different company and how that would really help although it can be very challenging i must admit as well uh, yeah. you have to have the right set of people nurturing you nurturing you looking out for your best interest and all that yeah. and you have to put in the effort on your own part as well to make sure that you're you're going above and beyond the bar to 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 prove your competence to prove that you've grown and that you're growing and you want to still grow in new opportunities i think those are key as well um thank you very much georgia this has been super amazing super intense but i know there are lots of people that will benefit from this and lots of things to unpack from what you've shared so far i want to appreciate everyone for listening to this point and wherever you're listening from i want to thank you for having the the nudge to actually come on board to hear all of what georgia has to say and if you've got questions as a result of what has been shared please put them in the comment box and i would send them over to georgia and if is it okay for people to reach out to you on linkedin or something yeah absolutely yeah yes so she's kindly offered to be reached out to if you've got any questions that you want her to really clarify on or some of the resources you've mentioned i i will probably get some of those links and put them in the description of this podcast so that you could have access to some of the resources that she's managed to leverage on her career path so far um so and also if you haven't subscribed to this channel please do that and share with people you think would find it very useful Thank you once again, Georgia, for coming on board. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been good fun. Yeah, I, I really had a lot of fun and 
insightful fun <laughs> to yes. be honest yeah. So. <laughs> all right yeah so thank you very much and i wish everyone a lovely rest of their day cheers Thank you.